Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, happy Monday. It's also President's Day in the United States. We're not going to dive into that. I'm not going to wish anybody a happy President's Day because, gosh, like we have a lot to contend with with our histories. But welcome to Data is Love. My name is Aparna and I'm the founder of Moving Beyond. And if you have never been here before, um, then just get ready to hear from an incredible human being talking about all things data and workplace equity. Lori, welcome. Welcome. Thank you for spending your Monday morning with me. Thank you for inviting me. This is so exciting. It's a topic I love to talk about. Um, folks, Lori has already told me that like she's going to talk about what she's going to talk about. So I think I'll present some questions as suggestions. Um, but can we actually start with um, who are you? And also something that folks, I think many folks don't know that are tuning in right now. You went back to graduate school. You went back to get a PhD at a time where I can only imagine your career was thriving, like you were thriving in your career. Thank you. Thank you for putting it that way. I would say my career was, you know, I was in my later stages, moving towards my later stages of my career. Um, I think the best way to explain why I went back to graduate school is I'm also a coach. And when I went through my coaching certificate, we did a program uh, exercise about describing your ideal life. And my ideal life included getting up and having tea and doing research and then yeah. doing workshops and doing some training. And I thought, huh, I really don't think I can do research the way I want without a, a PhD. Um, and I'm just super curious about people and data and why we do the things we do. So I thought, why not? Um, let's do it. Okay. I love it. I don't know. I don't, I guess I don't know too many people that are like, I have a great job. I get paid well. Um, let me go, let me go do right. Like, like all of this research, writing, taking the exams. Um, it's a lot, of, it's a lot of work. Um, curious, like what have been, cause you were doing a lot of this research at the start of the pandemic, right. For, for your, uh, mm -hmm. for your PhD, what are some things that have like stood out to you as learnings or takeaways or maybe things that you've noticed um, that are worth sharing with the rest of us? Definitely. And I think the um, probably the learnings that intersect with DEI, um, B and J, that data and that data set really was around how I did a lot of work in portfolio work and running a portfolio and getting data and getting that back to people. And I realized that if you don't, no one owns the data. Like I can give mm -hmm. reports and leaders would be like, yeah, I don't agree with it. And it's like, it came from your people. <laughs> I didn't make it up. And I think sometimes when we run reports, the illusion is that we somehow are doing something to the data. And how do we give the ownership to the person? Like, this is your data. Mm -hmm. So that really kind of that curiosity of like, how do people engage with data and questions really drove me to my research. And I, re I researched how male leaders perceive enacting inclusion and diversity practices. And I picked that because I realized they kind of get left out of the conversation a lot. It kind of happens around them. And then they're like, hey, can I have some talking points? Um, and what I found is it really is for them, uh, for some. So I would say there's three groups of them. Um, and one of them is they're really part of this and they get it. And they like in, intrinsically, there's a reason that they feel included into the conversation. And I think for a lot of them, they kind of get a free pass if they do their real job. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not really part of what they do. So I kind of packaged them into three groups. One is a group that has very little intent or impact. That kind of, that, that's that group. I'm gonna do my business, I'm gonna deliver on my business and I'm gonna outsource kind of any work that doesn't relate to directly to what I perceive as my business. The middle mm -hmm. group is I have a lot of intention. I really wanna do good things. Um, sometimes they can have negative impact if they don't do the work themselves. So they don't really 
go out and learn things. They're, they're the talking points leaders. Just give me some talking points. Mm -hmm. and you and I both know this is a complex area and talking points usually don't cut it, especially during COVID when I'm faced with racial tension, like we haven't seen in a while in the U S everyone's mm -hmm. affected. We're staying home. We have to care about mental health. So it was really kind of this point where leaders had to engage on this topic. And the last group is the people that really have strong intent and have impact and they know how to navigate that. I would actually, I, th I would have thought that the talking point people were in the first group of the little intent and no impact, but you put, you put the talking point people in the middle group. Yeah. Cause I think they want, they really do care. They want to do, they, they cared about their employees that were now all of a sudden working from home and they cared about people that had, you know, small children or they couldn't see their parents for years because their parents lived in other countries. Like they, they truly care about the people side and mm -hmm. the technical side because I was in technology. Yeah. Um, but it really was that, that they kind of got themselves into a corner because they talked from mostly from their story and their perspective. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you can trip over some things. Yeah, during this time frame, there's one leader that I was working with that was a talking points kind of person, and he opened like an all teams converse, like an like an all hands conversation with saying, um, like basically sharing that he picked up the phone and called an African American colleague that he'd worked with many years, like maybe decades before, as his like one great act of doing DEI. And I remember looking at the faces of the non-white folks and the women in that call. And they were like, excuse me, like, what? Yeah. And he was so proud, you know, he was like, I picked up the phone and I called this guy and I let him know that I had his back. And I was like, okay, but you literally haven't spoken to this person in 10 plus years. Yeah. And and nobody could tell him otherwise, right? Like nobody could tell him that that was a real miss on his part. Um, yeah, I think like I think about that call so often when I think of these leaders that they care, they want to care, but gosh, like they have some work to do and how they show up. Yeah. And I think that's exactly it. Your example highlights it. Um, when we were chatting last week, you said something that I highlighted and like bolded in my notes. And you said, men go around the system and women advocate for changes that benefit lots of people, not just themselves. Mm -hmm. um, will you say, will you say more about that? And like, like, what does that then mean for DEI? So it was, it was fascinating. I did ask um, the leaders in my study had you like, what was your fear from stepping in the space? And they're like, well, I'll make a mistake and I'll get fired and blah, blah, blah. And then I asked, have you ever had those experiences? And only one had. So, okay. I, and I think that's where men, the systems are basically male. I looked at the kind of the normalization of the U S culture is male. The normalization of how Western leadership is kind of male based technology of male culture, and then just maleness. And then you put DEI on top of that. So the system is very familiar to most men, and they just navigate it. Mm -hmm. So if you know the system, you can go around the system. Where women and other, um, I'll just say, I'm a, most everyone in the world yeah. has to then challenge the system because if you're not in it you don't necessarily understand all the nuances and one of the studies really was around young consultants and how they um, the male consultants would kind of be left off the hook because if they went and coached their child's little league mm -hmm. oh they were such a nice man isn't he special and isn't he unique and he cares about his family that was a positive but if a mm -hmm. woman had to for daycare or to go get their child or go coach it was a negative. So that's, I think it's, and I'm not sure that men intentionally do it. I think it's just society and everything also kind of supports that behavior. 
Yeah. And I think, I mean, also just applauds, right? I think men, mm -hmm. when men do, and like, we're also talking in like a very heteronormative context of like men and women and assuming that all or most families have one of each, right? Yep. Um, but I think there's like no shortage of memes that are that really ring true, for, I think for a lot of women, especially ones that have caregiving responsibilities about their spouses getting kudos for doing something really basic like buying groceries or making their child a sandwich or, you know, just like really normal basic things um, that women get, Right, yeah. like no, no applause. Like there's no applause because it's the the thing that's expected, and um, this like this idea of going around, going around the system. Mm -hmm. Um, do you feel like that's selfish? So, I I I don't know that I know. I think it or is. Is it, it is it strategic? Is it smart? Um, well, is it smart? Probably, because they usually get promoted. Um, is it right and just? No. Also, I'm not sure that for a lot of men it's intentional mm -hmm. how they go about their life. And if you only think of the world in your perspective, you think, of course, this seems to get me rewards. And if I do this, it's good. And if I do that, it's good. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep doing that. We're I don't have those choices necessarily. Mm -hmm. Don't have those choices to just go through the system. So often we're not heard as women or other identities, and so we tend to just start yelling louder because we want someone to hear. Yeah, yeah, yes. Oh, this is so nuanced. Okay, one of the places where this intersects with data is and you know we've talked about this a couple of different times right it's like all the different kinds of data that exists in organizations and it's like the personality tests or quizzes that we do there's also like inclusion surveys that we run or other employee engagement surveys that we run that are not new right like they existed in the pre-COVID times. And I think certainly big companies have a culture of doing them. It's the basis for a lot of the best places to work lists. And there's also like what's in your system of record, your HRIS and, um, and so many other, right? So many other places. It shows up in like, it shows up in lots of different places but we're not always connecting those things, mm -hmm. right? And like last week when we were chatting, you talked a lot about like, what would it mean if either these systems could be talking to each other or as leaders, we could be looking across this cross section, this, all of this data that already exists in our organization. And I'm, I'm wondering if you'll, you'll say more on that. Yes, I always have something to say <laughs> about that. <laughs> Probably because most of my career was looking at data and running reports and and I think the simplest thing is we just deliver leaders reports and keep in mind, I, I appreciate a leader has so many different things are managing at any one given time. And yeah. they don't have the, content, the capacity to, to want, you know, at 10 o'clock get a finance report and then mm -hmm. at 2 o'clock get a people report on, you know, how diversity hires. And then at yeah. 4 o'clock another report on their engagement. Mm -hmm. We're asking them, hold all of that and create your own story about how you're really doing. Yeah. Um, and I think a good example is when I was doing portfolio, one of the things I had to do is pick the resources that were getting hit all the time on projects. So a certain type of skill set. That was a standalone thing to say these five people are getting exhausted. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't connected to any of the personality things. So maybe those leaders thought it was perfectly fine because that was just work. Mm -hmm. And I'm highly ambitious. And I want to be recognized. And they helped me do that. So there was no connection to how the systems are helping these people or hurting them. And leaders don't get all of the story together. Um, so. Have you ever seen it done well? Like, have you ever seen, because you've, you've been in the industry for a long time. And now you have the vantage of having 
gone into organizations as a researcher is anybody doing it well is anybody looking at you know like their disk assessments and saying gosh like we really all the leaders in our organization are red and right like or yeah like who 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 is looking who is doing this well so you're like nobody nobody's getting nobody. it right and for a couple of reasons. One is just the systems we have. You would think that if I was an employee, my employee ID number would be the same in every system we have. Nope, that's not true. That's not true. So just the systems and trying to create these reports. I think I've spent five years on and off in my career trying to get HR folks and HR data analysts to help me combine it with diversity inclusion data and there's mm -hmm. always a problem and always a struggle. And I think the biggest struggle from an organization perspective is if each discipline is answering their own questions. So we mm -hmm. have that for us, you know, mm -hmm. well, these are our questions, DE and I folks think these are our questions, finance people, and no one is sitting above them, helping them understand the cross sectionality of those or intersectionality of those. So that's one of the problems. The other problem is when we give feedback on, and I do a lot of Hogan and DISC and those kinds of assessments, we don't ever include, and this is why inclusion might be challenging for you. You're high on ambition, you're high on security. If I see that stepping into the space is a big risk, I'm probably not going to because my style and approach is that I really love security and I'm not gonna jump out on a limb. So helping those leaders understand with your style, this is what it could look like. So we yeah. train them to do these debriefs, but we don't add the next level lens onto it. I have not seen that. That's so interesting. I guess I've, I've not even thought to do that myself when I'm working with organizations to say, yeah, let's look at your, let's look at your team makeup by, the disc styles or the Hogan styles, or even, I mean, I personally hate the Strengths Finder um, or Myers Briggs, right? Mm -hmm. But what are the dominant styles? And if those styles are not the advocates, if those styles are not the trailblazers, the risk takers, then it's not gonna, it's really not gonna move very far mm -hmm. because you don't have people with the capacity to push the agenda forward. And yeah. so then you just get like ERGs and celebrations and burnt out volunteers trying to make movement. Um, what are like, what are other kinds of data in an organization that we're not considering um, to tell this better, different story? Um, you know, I, I can go back to the kind of projects and that we're doing or not doing. What are we trying to impact? How are we trying to impact them? What does it mean to the, res the employees and the resources in our organization, whether they be employees or other financial resources? Like, where's our money going? Mm -hmm. And then are we supporting that? And if we're driving really hard in the market, it's yeah. really hard to find the space to um, have the energy to then think about these holistically. And the other part of my study was really around paradoxes that leaders have to face. And that I think talks about like today and tomorrow. So a lot of leaders, so a lot of reports are built on what are we building today? Progress reports on mm -hmm. progress, status reports. A lot of DE&I stuff is really around tomorrow. Like how yeah. do we get to tomorrow? Yeah. So holistically, where are our reports talking about? Are they talking about today? And talking about tomorrow, um, caring for others and, and revenue growth. So if all of our reporting is on, mm. it's kind of, I think of a whole person. We're just talking about what the hands are doing, but we're not talking about what the heart and head is doing. Yeah. So. Ooh, pro yeah. I'm just, I'm like, I'm still mulching on the progress report. It's like what, it's like, it's today. It's also like what's already happened. Mm -hmm. right it's it's also already what's happened if you did an inclusion survey by the time that any analysis lands on the desk of a leader it's many months after that survey has happened and it's been sanitized um mm -hmm. right and it's like 
this was what was true in September and you are now looking at it in December. Yeah. yeah, it's not it's not future facing, but also this idea of caring for others and revenue growth and that we are tracking profitability by quarter or annually. Um, and a culture of care takes how many years yeah. to build in an organization? And performance reviews, I think, are the same. I was kind of pondering that last night. A lot of companies are going to these quarterly connects. Yeah. They're still doing kind of the old, like, give me everything you've completed. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you're proud of. Yeah. But not about the journey. Who did you help along the journey? How many people did you promote? How many people did you help? What skills did your team get mm -hmm. during the period if you're a leader? So it, we tend to sit in the past a lot, assuming that that's going to be. Um, and I'll just say the other message that came out loud and clear is if you could measure DEI, I, I would do it. Yeah. Um, which I think goes to your point. We create a lot of awareness around the data, but we don't create a lot of desire to change. Just giving reports. I, know I will <laughs> double, I mean, 100%, I would double click on that. Um, but I want to go back to this idea of like, you you brought up performance reviews, right? Um, and there are lots of philosophies on the right way of doing them, how often to do them. Last night, as I was scrolling through my news feed, I saw probably six or seven different articles in like Business Insider and Forbes and like the, the Washington Post and Financial Times focused on something that I guess I hadn't paid attention to before, which is companies or rather leaders having quotas on how many people have to get poor reviews so that they can justify the next round of layoffs and like first line managers, right? Um, like managers of people, managers of ICs, noticing, noticing that, noticing that trend, noticing that they're walking into these calibration meetings and uh, not being able to advocate for someone who's amazing in their organization. And I was like, mm. so like right now you're getting pressure to show gains, but you risk. Like, what's the risk yeah. of using performance reviews to get people to either quit or to lay them off in six months from now? And will yeah. they want to come back and work for your company? It's, it's a thing, isn't it? <laughs> And, and the messaging is all year long, we're going to have these core connects and we're going to support you and we're going to encourage you for development and you and your own career and go for it. And mm -hmm. we're going to help you. And then that moment where as a manager, you have to say, this is how I rank my people. Mm -hmm. um, I've been there. It's horrific. And it's so not aligned with how I view my role as a development manager. I've never been there and I just feel nauseous reading the articles, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. It feels, it feels the opposite of equity and inclusion. Totally. Yeah. And it's um, where your bias I think shows up real quick. Cause if you have the same experience as me and you went to the same schools and you have this, then I, I can trust, I'm going to put that in quotes that you yeah. can deliver what I need you to deliver. But if you went through a different path, then mm -hmm. hmm, maybe I can't, even though you've up to this point been a good performer. Um, and I don't, again, I don't, I think it's just one of those unconscious biases. That I think it's actually, I would actually push back and say that I think it's a, it's a conscious bias. Um, I've, I have, and I think it's a conscious bias much in the same way you started this conversation by saying, you know, no one owns the data, right? Like the data is the experience or the, the reality of people in your organization right here, right now. Um, but leaders will look at it and say, I don't like it, or I don't, I don't, I don't believe this is true. Right. Yeah. Which you're like, well, what do you mean you don't believe it's like, like you don't, you don't like the demographic data of your organization? What do you mean you don't, you don't like it? Like it's, it's who makes up your organization today. 
And I think in the same way, I've definitely seen lots of hiring managers that'll say, well, yeah, yeah, like I'll check my unconscious bias, but if so-and-so went to UVA, I'm yeah. definitely going to prioritize interviewing them. Or if so-and-so, right, worked on such and such yeah. team, I would, def well, I'm definitely going to interview them. And I'm like, right, but they don't actually meet like 50% of the, the, the required qualifications. And they're like, yeah, but you know, UVA puts out good people, right? So I feel like that, that a lot of that bias is, it's front and center for folks. I think hiring, absolutely front and center. I think by the time you know someone for a year, you kind of. Oh, it's in the back. You're saying it's, it's like yeah. by the time you're giving them a review, yeah. it's like in the back of your mind. And most of the time you don't, probably think about it too much until mm -hmm. someone says ranked these people. And then anyone that looks like me unchecked will be ranked higher. Yeah. And I think that that's probably happening a lot, except, except I know that there, there is some really interesting research around when women promote other women, they're seen as it's like a pity move, right? Like mm -hmm. you're just helping your kind move ahead in life um, or when in particular I think when black folks promote other black folks yeah right versus we don't really we don't really ask that question to like white men for instance it's like oh you promoted another white man is that like are you just supporting the brotherhood of white men is that is that your move so where do we go from here we know that there's data that lives in lots of different places that should be talking to each other and when it can and does we can make different decisions there's also this piece around shifting will mm -hmm. to show up differently where do we get started because it's so many things to think about what's like the what are the first two steps that someone can take i think part of it is your role so if you're a leader um and i Someone asked me, well, what, what do I do in DE and I am belonging? Just, I don't even know. And I was like, yeah. pick an identity that makes you uncomfortable. Mm. And just learn. Don't go to people that hold those identities and say, tell me. <laughs> There's plenty yeah. of resources. Explore yeah. the experiences, the history. What has happened historically? What is the trauma identity? particular identity space because I feel like that gives you some perspective to start the conversation and not from a time hey Perna, just tell me about your experience but like hey these are the kinds of things I'm questioning and how do I create space for this voice to be heard so it's for me it's becoming an ally and creating when you have a platform creating the space for other people to step in and not for me to help but and to create the space and then step back because mm -mm. um, I think a lot of people think well I, I need to help others I don't, I don't need you to help me I need you to move out of the way <laughs> sometimes so yeah. I think sometimes it's just learning how to move <laughs> out of the way I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in people that coach leaders mm -hmm. thinking about the holistic and understanding the, the, the paradoxes they face. And I, yeah. So those are the two top two, if I would say that. <laughs> I think the discipline of human resources needs to expand their understanding of their role. I love that you weren't like jumping to, well, let me tell you like a pivot table or power BI is where you need to be. Like you're really saying I need to like work on myself, like and how I'm showing up, like the technical stuff, like I, I guess I'm extrapolating. It's like the technical stuff, like we have skills in the system to manage that. And you and I both know when you run reports, it's the question that you're asking that generates the report, not the data. It's, it's saying, what do I want to answer? It's leaders saying, this tells me all about my revenue. It doesn't tell me anything about the feelings of my people. As my money goes up, are my people feeling worse? Am I, am I balancing that appropriately? Yeah. 
So, you know, the last two guests I've had have also talked about data for equity, of course, like we talk about this every week. Um, the very first person I had on as a guest this year, um, Dr. Holly Bregman, actually talked about when you're hiring a DEI leader that is going to, you know, sort of implement a data informed approach, their technical skills matter less. Their ability to query well matters more, right? Yeah. Like their ability to ask the right question matters more because you can find the technical skills. Um, and that was really interesting. And last week I had on a black man who is a Power BI coach and so much of the work that he does is linking the different pieces in an organization's life cycle so a leader can see exactly what you're talking about is like all right like right now my revenue is going up but like are my people really depressed yeah you know are they really struggling because then what's the consequence of that two quarters from now yeah yeah and um i, I will say in my own experience people that work in de and i often shy away from data I'll say that's yeah. a big brush, <laughs> big brush. And it really can be your, your friend because you ask the right questions. You can at least tell the story. Um, yeah. Like your last yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, absolutely. And I think you and I both hear that a lot, right? Where people are like, I, I became an HR practitioner or I became a DEI practitioner and become passionate about a certain kind of change in organizations. But one of the skills that I'm really missing is data literacy. Yeah. Um, not even analysis. It's like at, at like really, really basic data literacy. Um, before we end the conversation today, um, how can people get in touch with you? If they want to tap into your wisdom and your many years of experience driving change, what's the best way to connect with you? Um, so my website, tambarkcreek.com. Um, there's a link you can schedule time. I'm happy to talk to anyone um, about coaching, about this kind of work. Um, there's, yeah, just grab some time, send me an email. There's my email on my site. Um, yeah, there's lots of good goodness out in the world. And you can help people figure out where they need to focus. Um, I'm just putting words in your mouth. Um, thank you so much for spending your Monday morning with me and uh, I feel like you've given us so many things to mulch on for the rest of the week. The thing that is going to stay with me is paradoxes that leaders have to face. I, I think I'm going to be thinking about that for quite some time. Lori, thank you. And thanks to everybody that tuned in this morning. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Have a great day, folks.